I'm Hemant Mehta. This is Jessica Blumke. And you're listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. And today we are here with Dr. Karen Stolznow, who is a doctor in linguistics with a background in history and anthropology. And she is the author of several books, including Haunting America, God Bless America, and her newest book, Language Myths, Mysteries, and Magic. Thanks for joining us, Karen. Thank you for having me. And yes, yeah, surprisingly, that last one doesn't have America in it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're ruining the theme there. What exactly do those three things, the the myths, the mysteries, the magic, what do those have in common? I'm sorry, you kind of cut out there. Oh, no. What do those uh, three things in your title have in common? Uh, myths, mysteries, and magic. Well, some time ago, I had a friend ask me, "What is? you're a linguist, what has linguistics got to do with skepticism and atheism? And I said, well, plenty of things. It's really a a kind of uh, foundational topic, I think, to skepticism. Uh, there are just so many things that I can um, do investigations into, whether it's prediction or prayer or speaking in tongues or xenoglossia, backmasking. The, the topics are really uh, endless. So I decided it was time to write a book that treats all of those language-specific paranormal and pseudoscientific claims, or as many as I could possibly fit into one book. Um, so, are, do you study how linguistics apply to specific, I don't know, myths and things like that? Like how language evolves to fit, you know, various things? Or what, what's the basis of the book? Well, I think when I started studying linguistics as a student long ago, uh, I just found that there were a lot of preconceived ideas that I had about language um, that some ways of speaking are better than others. And I just had all these ideas that I think the average person does have about language until you study it at university level. And uh, so I was really fascinated by uh, the, the myths that the course was busting for me. So I thought, is there there's some way I can really um, treat that? This is, I think, more, rather than being academic, this is more of a pop science kind of a book. So I'm looking at all the, all the kinds of things that skeptics tend to be interested in, um, stuff like graphology and body language and hypnosis and so trying to look at the uh, the science out there, is there science to these things, um, you know, or has has research disproved these concepts? Um, so I tried to, to tackle it uh, from as much of a scientific perspective as possible, but meanwhile making it interesting for the, the layperson who doesn't want to hear all of the, the terminology. When you said when you were in university that there were language myths busted for you, can you Go into that. I want to What's hear about What's the biggest that. myth that you busted? Um, oh, you mean from a, a kind of academic level instead of uh, a more pop science level? Yeah, uh, and the pop science side too. Yeah, what would really surprise us uh, that we have a misconception about? Oh, well, I think uh, really all of these topics, unfortunately. I mean, there are some strange things as usually is the case, fact is stranger than fiction. Uh, there is a particular condition called foreign accent syndrome. I don't know if you guys have heard of that phrase before. Foreign accent I'm sure syndrome? I'm across... I'm um, sorry? Foreign accent syndrome? Foreign accent syndrome. Uh, and so I'm sure you would have heard of stories in the media of a woman who gets a bump on the head and starts speaking another language. Um, or of a, a person who uh, maybe has a migraine and then suddenly... They, they can't speak with their usual accent uh, or other people who might suffer some kind of brain trauma and then they can't speak their native tongue and they're speaking some other language and you think this is just, this is something out of a book, this is crazy, this can't possibly uh, be a, a true thing. Surely it's fake. And there is actually a condition called bilingual aphasia um, where a person can, if they get a bump on the head and they've suffered a brain trauma, um, then they might lose access to their native language. Um, usually it's a temporary thing and it kind of depends on how young you are and how healthy you are otherwise uh, and where the, the brain trauma took place. Um, but you might be able to, to reclaim that first language again, but usually they'll switch into another language. So it can be a, a second language that you have uh, that you speak or even if you... There's one case of a, a Croatian girl who was in some kind of accident and then started speaking German and it turns out that she was learning German at school. Uh, and so that, that explains that. But it's a really fascinating thing. 
um, that because it just seems like something that's a big myth and that this actually can happen is a so there are a really people bizarre thing. there are people who actually think that you could get like conked on the head and all of a sudden you learn a brand new language just like that. Yeah, so it's not so much a matter of a person uh, just being able to speak that language out of nowhere. They would have had to have had some kind of exposure to it. Um, so if you go and just now deliberately bump your head into a door, you're not going to start speaking French if you didn't previously huh. have knowledge of French. That sounds a lot like, you know, we hear those stories about people who had near-death experiences, things like uh, Colton Burpo in Heaven is for Real, who, you know, they go into this what looks like a coma, they're, they're close to death, and then all of a sudden they recall all these things that may have happened in the past or they know things about their parents that their parents don't remember ever telling them. And it sounds like, well, the truth is they probably did have exposure to that information at some point in the past, uh, even if Absolutely. we weren't sure when that happened. Yeah, it can be a combination of dreams or of hallucinations or of experiences the person's had. I don't know if you guys would be familiar with the uh, Bridie Murphy case at all. I am not familiar with that. Me neither. Oh, it's a, a case of a woman. She actually lived uh, nearby to me in Pueblo in uh, Colorado, and she was seeing some kind of one of those repressed memory therapists, and she was having all of these recollections of a previous life that she'd had growing up in, I think, Cork in Ireland. And she started speaking in an old Irish language. Uh, she started singing old Irish songs. And she was having these memories of names and places and faces that she couldn't possibly have had. So, of course, this was around the time where uh, the idea of reincarnation was becoming very popular. And this particular story really popularized uh, reincarnation in the eyes of the public. Um, so it was a, a very fascinating story that she just had access to all of this information. And of course, when they do research into it, it seems like this person was genuine and that they had had these experiences and these places did exist and these people did exist. So it turns out in the end that it's not so mystical. This woman is being uh, hypnotized by this therapist who is partially implanting some of these memories into, into this person. Um, and her name is, uh, her, her actual name is Virginia Ty. And uh, there was a Bridie Murphy who did exist. And rather than being someone who'd lived generations previously in Ireland, it was actually a neighbor of hers when she was growing up. <laughs> so these were stories that she'd been told by this neighbor. Uh, she'd heard snippets of Irish songs and had heard stories of her, uh, her youth and growing up and her parents. So she'd really taken on these experiences as her own. So that's a fascinating thing that can happen with repressed memory syndrome or false memory syndrome. Um, and so, you know, that's a, another crazy true thing out there that isn't as paranormal as it initially sounds. Well, that kind of makes me think of something I read in your book. I think it was, I can't think of which chapter it was, but that people say, you know, they start speaking in tongues or they start saying they speak Chinese, but nobody around them actually speaks Chinese. And so where do they pick it up from? Well, it's, I don't think they actually are speaking it. They're just making <laughs> sounds that sound to that. Is that right, Karen? Is that kind of? Yes. Yeah, well, there is, uh, with speaking in tongues or, or glossolalia, as it's known, um, so you were talking about people speaking Chinese. That goes back to the story of uh, uh, Agnes Osman, who was the first person to speak in tongues in recent times. So she was from Topeka, Kansas. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. I never seem to. Yeah, you're saying um, But yeah. she was a student of Charles Parham, who owned a Bethel Bible uh, church in Kansas. And so one day, this teacher, Charles, was talking to his pupils and his students and uh, asking them about uh, the evidence for baptism uh, in the Holy Spirit. And he said, what is this first evidence for baptism in the Holy Spirit? And so the students decided that that was speaking in tongues. And so he disappeared for a couple of days. So he was, I think, uh, on holidays or something. And when he came back, he discovered that one of his students was actually able to speak in tongues and that she could speak in Chinese uh, and that she gave an example to him. And um, so if that was really the birth of speaking in tongues as being evidence that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, but of course, she wasn't speaking Chinese. She was speaking with a Chinese accent and it was really glossolalia, which is uh, when you go to a church, a, a charismatic church, and you have a whole group of people who are really living in the moment and they're all being inspired by everyone else there. They're all getting in on the act. 
Uh, they all I, think I they're speaking kind of, in another language, but if you, you, they all think they're speaking in another language, but if you actually ha- got a translator, they're it's not just, actually saying anything. It's, it's just gibberish. gibberish. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's gibberish. It's gobbledygook. It's not language. So if you've got a, a linguist like me to come in, or uh, an, a historical linguist who could just look at uh, real ancient languages that exist, it doesn't have any structure. It doesn't have grammar. It doesn't have meaning. But then, unfortunately, you usually have someone who has the gift of interpretation of tongues. So they say, <laughs> well, I can understand what this person is saying. <laughs> they're interpreting uh, so they're, a language that doesn't they're exist. They're talking about uh, you know, our, our community, and they're coming up with all of these uh, you know, possible interpretations and translations of what that person's saying, but it's really just, it's all assumption and uh, it's all... A collusion, people really working together because they believe in this or uh, because they have some kind of agenda. But it's not language because it, it can't, it's not uh, something that appears uh, across space and time. It's not something that uh, has any kind of structure to it where you can say, well, you know, this can be spoken by other groups of people too. It's just a one off thing, like scatting and jazz, really. Yeah, so you have people speaking a language that doesn't exist, people translating a language that doesn't exist, and the whole time they're just kind of egging each other on because each side confirms that there is a language here. It's long form improv. It's like if you go <laughs> oh, to Second yeah, City, yeah, that's what they teach you. There's yes, a kind and. Peer pressure yeah. to perform as well. Um, you know, if you, I've, I've got friends who grew up in charismatic and Pentecostal churches and they said they teach you how to do this. And if you don't do it, you're shunned by the community. You know, you have to participate. Uh, and if you don't, then you, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. You're right. a bad person. Uh, you're out. And I've heard from a lot of former Pentecostal uh, preachers, Pentecostal believers who can, if they wanted to, they could kind of get in the zone yeah, yeah. and speak in tongues again. And they now know they're just spouting gibberish. <laughs> but, but it's at the a time, learned it behavior. Oh, yeah. It's something, because it's learned, because it's a, a trained behavior, uh, and yet under MRI tests when people have, uh, their brains are being looked at, they're not accessing the parts of the brain um, that, that you language. They're using the more social parts of the brain. Um, so it's it's definitely not language. It's just a social phenomenon. Uh, it's very interesting. So, and I but, guess... Uh, the funny... Sorry? No, you go ahead. I was just going to talk about the uh, where uh, the idea originally came from, speaking tongues in the Bible and Acts. Um, that was not actually the, the same thing. It wasn't a matter of people speaking gibberish. Um, the original story, the day of Pentecost, um, is more kind of xenoglossia, where people are suddenly... Um, being understood, you had all the, the apostles who were gathered together in the, in a room and um, they were trying to preach the word of Jesus to everyone there. And when they started speaking, they found that even though people were from other countries and spoke other languages, they were all able to understand each other. So it was a kind of inverse tower of Babel. Um, so that's not the same thing as Glossolalia because they're just, as you said, speaking gobbledygook and gibberish. Well, and obviously this is all would just be us speculating, but do you guys think think that people sincerely believe they're speaking another language and like they're saying things and they understand what they're saying or is it the spirit moving through them so to speak or is it just monkey see monkey do everybody's making these sounds and I have to too yeah I think it depends on the group uh, and I think it depends on the person I'm positive that there would be people who believe that they really are speaking another language uh, and I think some people claim that they uh, have a kind of amnesia and they can't remember what it is that they've said. But if you've got a whole group of people uh, in a room who are all attesting to this, then there's a lot of pressure there to, to believe in it. Uh, but then I'm sure that there are people who don't really have any belief in, in what they're doing and they're just pulling the wool over the eyes of but others. Yeah. I wonder what the, I mean, this is obviously we don't have a number on this. I wonder what the percentage of people who say they're speaking in tongues mm-hmm. at a church what percent of them are just going along with it, going going with the flow, and they know that they're just doing it. They don't really feel the spirit. They know they're not actually saying anything. They know they're just spouting sounds. Well, that speaks to the yeah. whole church question, doesn't that it? How many people how many are, are actual believers? And that would be such a difficult thing to, to be able to research. Uh, I'm pretty sure that probably younger people would at first think this is silly, you know, what am I doing? But I think that the, the more that you become ingrained in that um and the more that you practice that, the more you would believe in it. And that's just the way that it is. And you've got the whole sunk cost fallacy thing going on um, where you've invested so much time and mm-hmm. effort and belief into that that it really becomes a part of you and something that uh, you can't be talked out of. 
Well, but you say, you know, young kids maybe think it's weird, but I feel like if you grow up in it, you never have the opportunity to not know that no that's No one a ever thing tells you that's right. an option that right. it doesn't work. That's right, yeah. So uh, it's a, a tricky thing, but I think it'd be a really interesting thing to, to research. I think we'd probably have to start with people who have deconverted, who, who are former Charismatics and Pentecostals to get some idea of that. Well, and that kind of makes me think, Karen, there is a part, uh, I think it was in the foreword of your book, that you said that you had moments, I think you uh, name-checked Quakers, that you'd be with these people, and you're like, oh my God, I think I believe this. I think I'm a Quaker. Is that that's something you said in your book, right? I'm not making yes, this up. Yes, yes, and I, I think the two that resonated with me the most, I mean, it's pretty hard for, for people like us to really understand what it's like to be a fundamentalist Mormon uh-huh. uh, or to be a, an Amish person or a Mennonite if you don't have exposure to those kinds of communities. But the two that really resonated with me and I think would resonate with a lot of atheists and skeptics would be Satanism and the Quakers. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's because uh, the Satanists tend to be non-theistic. They're not devil worshippers as such. They don't believe in Satan. Um, They're really just anti-Christians and they mock Christianity. Uh, And I won't say that, you know, that's necessarily a good thing, but they certainly tend to be atheists. They're they're not believing in... uh, uh, or, or worshiping the devil, mm-hmm. and with Quakers, I think that there there are lots of non-theist Quakers. They say that you can be a Buddhist and a Quaker, or you can be a, a Jew and a Quaker, and you can certainly be an atheist and a Quaker. And, and that sounds like the two are mutually exclusive, uh, but that's not the case. You can certainly uh, get involved in a lot of the social aspects of the community and not necessarily believe in a god uh, or a supreme being. Um, their services are more like a kind of meditation, even though they don't use that word. Um, and some of the, I found that a lot of older Quakers tend to believe in a God, but younger Quakers don't. Did you see the word spiritual get bandied about a lot? I feel like I hear that all the time, and I'm never that sure. That everyone's spiritual, everyone, even if they're non-theistic? Right, I don't believe in God, but I'm spiritual. Spiritual, but yes, religious. Yes, and I, I think that that's uh, really the way that, a lot of people tend to be moving, I think, uh, when it comes to having a religion or not having a religion in this country. They don't want to necessarily be seen as an atheist um, because of the negative connotations that are associated with that socially. So they'd rather see themselves as spiritual. So even if they don't subscribe to a god or a supreme being, uh, they still see themselves as, as being spiritual. And whether that's a connection to Mother Nature, to the Earth, or whether it's a connection to other people, um, they would still see themselves as being spiritual as an alternative to being an atheist. That's actually, that is a pretty big... So black and white about that. Right. That is a big demographic change that's going on. If you talk about what percentage, at least of Americans, mm-hmm. are atheists or agnostics, we're talking like 5%, 6% at best. Right. But when it comes to the people who are not religious or unaffiliated or the nuns, yeah, we, we jump up to 20%, 30% if you're looking at younger people. And yeah, a lot of these people say, I don't want to be an atheist. I don't want to say I'm an atheist. Mm-hmm. But, but I don't want to also say I'm religious either. So they do fall under this nebulous, weird, spiritual, I maybe there's something out there. I don't really know. Well, even Oh, anecdote- yeah. And I, I think when it comes to classification, they're really atheists. But it's a matter of self-identity. You know, how do these people identify? Um, you know, I think they're... There's also middling ground, too. You could call yourself a humanist instead mm-hmm. or a free thinker. Uh, but this, unfortunately, there are negative connotations associated with calling yourself a, an atheist. And so a lot of people would just rather back off from that term and, and say that they're nothing non-religious. And they, I grew up in Australia. And uh, even though I was an atheist, I never referred to myself that way. I called mm-hmm. myself non-religious. Right. Well, even anecdotally in my life, I'm, you know, doing what I do, haven't doing what you do. I kind of force that out of people in a way. Like if I say, you know, I'm a blogger, unfriendly atheist, that kind of draws that conversation. But I think if if I were not such an out atheist, my boyfriend, my parents, my brother, my my family, all of whom are non-believers, wouldn't it's just not a thing they would consider because it's not important enough. Yeah, like religion they don't is care so... about religion right. in general, right. so why bother calling myself an atheist? Because right. that almost sounds religious in a sense. But, but it's just easier atheist. to say, ah, I don't care about religion, I'm a nun. Right. Whatever. It's not an issue for me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just not so much of a problem, just the the, uh, the labeling situation in Australia. I just think, I don't really know what the st- statistics are in comparison, but um, certainly a lot more atheists than here. 
in, oh, some, yeah. in terms of some of these, you know, the churches you're talking about, uh, the churches that are charismatic, that are Pentecostal, um, is there a way we could kind of steer children in the direction where they know to question these things that, yeah, you're speaking in tongues, but you're, you're not really speaking in tongues. Is there a way to get them uh, to educate them about what's going on there, about the science behind uh, what's going on? That's a really interesting question. And unfortunately, so much education starts at home. Mm -hmm. It starts with the parents uh, and with extended family members and friends. And so if you're socialized into this, it's a really difficult thing to extricate yourself from and to educate these people. Um, so especially if you grew up in the Bible Belt of the United States or just various other areas that are religious, mm -hmm. it's really hard to break free from that. So I just don't know. It, it often seems to be the case that these people need to start questioning these things themselves and to have bad experiences. So uh, it kind of gives them a, leaves a bad taste in their mouth and they're looking for some kind of alternative. It's a really difficult thing. I'd like to see uh, critical thinking classes in schools um, or even at university level. There just isn't enough of that sort of thing, but I just don't know how to, to implement it. it um, I think it's you know, a matter of us kind of doing our own evangelism as much as possible, um, you know, wherever we can. When it comes to these churches that are using the, the speaking in tongues, do you know if that's on the rise at all or is that on the decline? Or is it just steady? Um, I think it's pretty steady. These groups comprise maybe about 25% of Christians. So uh, I guess it's a, they're in the minority, but that is not a... Uh, I mean, that's a substantial amount of people still yeah. who um, have those beliefs. So, you know, and certainly other Christians have uh, their own strange beliefs as well. Um, so it's a, a very large amount of people and... Um, I just, I, I don't think it's necessarily on the increase, but it's pretty steady. It's not, it doesn't seem to be disappearing very quickly. 25% is a lot more than I would think. 25% of Christians, you said, are Pentecostals? Um, yeah, they're, uh, I'm sorry, you kind of... 25% of they, Americans, you're saying? Or, no, 25% of, of Christians are, are Pentecostals? Pentecostals? Um, yes, they are Christians, so they're not mainline Christians. Um, but and you you also have members of uh, the Catholic Church who are charismatic as well. They're usually a smaller percentage, um, but yeah, they they are Christian. Is this strictly an American phenomenon? I mean, in terms of how gullible we are to fall for that sort of thing, or do you see at least pockets of it in Australia and in other countries too? You do see pockets of it in other countries, and um, particularly places in Africa. It's very common. You'll find it in Asia. You'll really find it in all four corners of the globe. Uh, and it is something that originated here. It's a, a homegrown thing. Um, and you, you certainly have some elements of it that come from other countries. I mean, if you look at someone like Padre Pio uh, in Italy, and his, he was a charismatic Catholic. Um, so it's absolutely practiced in other countries, but it's, it's pretty much uh, you know, originated here. We should be proud to say <laughs> Congratulations, America. We did yeah, it. Well, <laughs> we did it. That's the thing. A lot of these religions that I look at, um, you know, they have originated in the States and uh, and certainly other ones came from other countries and um, they've been adopted here um, very happily. I think it's a well, country that really wants to uh, hold on to its freedom of religious beliefs and, and so therefore a lot of these religions that might have died out in other places in the world have flourished here and taken on uh, new aspects do we think other countries have such a... People in America tend to be very precious about other people's... Even if it's not my religion, people in general tend to be very precious about it. I'm not going to question your religion because it's your religion. Is do we is that true in other countries? Or do other countries put more pressure on... Do they really question those charismatic speakers? Right. Do they do, uh, Are they more critical thinking of those issues? Oh, that is such a broad question. I guess it would really depend on the country. I think... In a place like uh, Australia, we tend to be a little bit more cynical. And so if someone believes something that we think is strange, we, we might question it. Mm -hmm. uh, we might ridicule them as well. Um, and obviously we don't have the the history that you have here where uh, a lot of people come from other countries and they were persecuted. And so to, to come to this country and be able to practice 
freely is just such an important thing and is just part of the cultural ethos. And this is not necessarily the case in other countries. Uh, but then at the same time, in many countries in Africa, uh, I think there are so many people who, if they, they're not religious, uh, you know, when it comes to maybe charismatic beliefs, um, they might practice voodoo or something else uh, that's pseudoscientific and based in paranormal and su supernatural beliefs. Uh, so if it's a, a common thing, I guess it's just not really going to be questioned as much. Again, it's a kind of socialization. If you grow up with it, then it's a very normal thing to you. Well, Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. And for everyone listening, Karen's new book is called Language Myths, Mysteries, and Magic. And if you'd like to get uh, a link to that book, you can find more about Karen's Dr. Karen Stolls now and this podcast at FriendlyAtheist.com. And if you like what you're hearing, feel free to go to Patreon.com slash Hemant, that's He-Man T, and pitch in if you like what you're listening to. Thank you, everyone. I'm Hemant Mehta. This is Jessica Blumke. Thanks for listening.